All right, guys, come on in, settle down. We're going to start. Cool. All right. Um, now we have a talk from Santosh uh, talking about challenges of file system isolation at Twitter. Uh, it's a pretty exciting topic. So hopefully we'll have a lot of lessons that we can learn for production usage. And oh yeah, Santosh is an Apache Aurora committer and an engineer at Twitter. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so um, during the last, uh, during the early part of the year, um, I was working on uh, trying to enable font system isolation in the Mesos clusters at Twitter as a way to improve our operational efficiency. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, share my experience uh, about the challenges that we faced um, and the lessons that we learned along the way. So first off, uh, let me tell uh, how it all began. Um, during the beginning of the year, uh, uh, the Mesos uh, host had uh, been running CentOS 5, and these were uh, going towards end of life, which meant we had to upgrade the operating system on all of our hosts. Um, and move on to CentOS 7. And we had to do this with a couple of constraints to make sure that there was zero impact to any running services. And we also had to do it uh, in a short period of time, less than three months. And uh, to put things into perspective as to where the challenges actually come from, it's mostly due to the scale of uh, Twitter's clusters. Um, our Mesos cluster runs about uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of containers on tens of thousands of machines uh, belonging to thousands of different services. And we, all, uh, we manage all of these with a team of a handful of engineers, like less than 10. Um, let me talk about how a typical uh, container infrastructure is usually set up. It usually contains both a container image and a container runtime. And uh, any infrastructure that uses a container image gets file system isolation for free. Um, and there are several types of image formats that are uh, available uh, in the community right now, uh, namely Docker, AppSea, and OCI. On their corresponding runtimes are Docker, Rocket, and RunC. Uh, however, um, so yeah, uh, using container images provides file system isolation. I just want to. Uh, call this out. Um, the, at Twitter, uh, we have some peculiarities in the way we use our Mesos cluster or the way we set up our Mesos clusters. Uh, and these peculiarities are that we don't uh, use a container runtime and, sorry, uh, we don't use a container image. Uh, and uh, for the container runtime itself, we use uh, the Mesos containerizer. Um, the Mesos containerizer is very modular, and it allows to work with or without container images. Uh, since we don't use a container image, uh, we don't essentially get any file system isolation on our containers. So how is life without container images at Twitter? So a typical uh, developer's workflow involves building their binaries, uh, uploading them to our internal binary store, uh, and when he wants to uh, launch an application, uh, you fetch the binary from uh, into the container and start running the application. So uh, since uh, we don't have a container image where you can uh, package your dependencies, uh, service owners get a couple of building blocks to build on. And uh, out of the box, we provide both the JVM and the Python uh, runtimes on our uh, Mesos hosts. Uh, we know that it's a limited amount of choices, but uh, the combination of both Python and Java put together gives a very powerful system, uh, very powerful platform where it can build uh, complex and extensive uh, systems. Uh, as a matter of fact, entire Twitter is based off of both just the, uh, Java and Python. Um, what this results in is that uh, the artifacts that get built for the applications are either a jar or a PEX. And these artifacts have this nice property that they are usually self-contained in terms of dependencies. Um, so now um, 
since the platform provides uh, both the JVM and Python out of box, uh, it becomes the platform owner's uh, responsibility to maintain Java and Python runtime on these machines. So uh, we can view the infrastructure at Twitter uh, and its ownership model uh, uh, like this diagram. Anything above the line uh, is owned by service owners, and anything below is owned by the platform owners. So uh, when an application needs to be updated, uh, we use uh, Aurora to push the built uh, artifacts, such as the jars or the pexes, into the containers. Uh, however, when it comes to the host, where if, the, if there is a requirement to update the JVM or the Python, we have a separate uh, puppet, in the puppet infrastructure, which actually pushes, pushes the libraries into the host and gets them installed. So uh, due to the fact that we don't have any file system isolation in our clusters, it can lead to bad behavior from uh, service owners, um, where services start uh, depending directly on libraries that are available on the Mesos hosts. So the service, uh, the containers, or the services running inside the container starts leaking below the line of separation and creates coupling between the host and the container. And this makes dependency management much more harder uh, since there's no file system isolation. Uh, just to give an example of uh, what really happened, uh, we had, uh, uh, we were rolling out a vulnerability fix, uh, and uh, we had a certain service which actually depended on a particular uh, MySQL client that was available on a host, on our Mesos hosts. And uh, uh, rolling out the fix ended up breaking this particular service, so we were forced to roll back the entire cluster uh, since we were affecting this single service. So um, we learned some lessons from it. Namely, that snowflakes are dangerous. That is, don't have uh, containers or any applications having unique configurations. Uh, it's also really hard to test uh, or canary any changes uh, at platform-wide uh, scale. Uh, what this means is that um, in order to gain more operational agility, uh, we needed a better dependency management system. And uh, what it meant is to basically break the coupling between um, the service and the host by enabling file system isolation. Um, so in the end, um, uh, we ended up actually upgrading all of our uh, hosts, uh, which is upwards of 30,000 hosts, uh, which corresponded to almost 99% of our fleet. Um, the remaining 1% is due to some Snowflake services, which uh, had some very really tight coupling, which had to be handled and uh, special cased. Um, and we did all this uh, with very minimal or like zero impact to any of our running services. All of this we did without even turning on file system isolation. So why didn't we turn it on? Before we see why we didn't turn it on, let me give you some background. Um, first off, what is file system isolation, right? Uh, file system isolation is a way to create an isolated environment for each container. On Linux, uh, it is achieved uh, with the combination of Cheroot and uh, shared subtrees. Uh, Cheroot is just uh, change root. Um, and it helps to create environments where the dependencies could be self-contained. So here we have an example where we have a host with a couple of containers on them. And uh, as you can see, the containers have their own uh, file system subtrees, and it is separated from each other and from the host. So uh, what, what it, how does uh, using file system isolation uh, change uh, our day-to-day uh, workflow. Uh, before, without, kind of, without any file system isolation, we did not have any container images that we had to fetch. Um, now that we are introducing, we had to have this extra step before actually creating a container, which is to fetch the image. Uh, we had to fetch the image before we could create the container, since uh, the image actually contains uh, the file system that would be unpacked and created that and gets mounted into the container. So um, 
we had a couple of requirements um, for the solution uh, for enabling file system isolation. Uh, first off, we had to ensure that uh, our container launch time would not change. And second off, we had to ensure that we get full adoption. Uh, we needed full adoption, which is to basically lift and shift all the uh, services into container images, because we had to pull this off in a short time of three months. Um, file system isolation could be achieved in different levels. First, uh, is the most obvious, there's no isolation where uh, both the container and the host share the file system. Uh, uh, and at the other end, we have full isolation where there is no, uh, both the host and the container have separate file system. Uh, there is a middle ground where there could be partial sharing of any, uh, some parts of the file system subtree uh, that is shared between the host and the container. Um, it's worth noting that since we are to lift and shift services, we had to package all the dependencies that were currently available on the Mesos host into the image. And this meant we had to get full file system isolation to ensure that we completely uh, decouple the hosts from the services. Um, at this point, it's worth noting that uh, the way containers work today, uh, uh, when a container actually executes, the container runtime uh, depends on the host kernel for execution. Uh, why is this important? It's because uh, if we, even if a container file system image has uh, specific kernel patches, these would not be in effect when the container is actually executing. So next, let's look at some of the technical details of uh, the choices uh, that we made for enabling full, full isolation. Uh, since uh, we had containers that were bleeding into the host and had coupling with the host itself, uh, we had to package all the dependencies, all the possible dependencies that were available on the host and create an image that would satisfy every service. This meant that we had to create a really big and fat image. And this image turned out to be close to five gigs in size. Um, now, looking back at our requirement that we do not change any uh, container launch time, uh, since we have this extra, extra step to actually fetch the image, uh, we had to look at the options that Mesos provided for fetching the image. Uh, Mesos agent provides a couple of ways of uh, fetching the image before launching a container. Uh, first one is the registry puller which can talk to any container registry and fetch the image. Um, one example would be the Docker registry. Uh, and at the other end, we have the local puller, which would just uh, copy the container image or read the container image uh, from the local host uh, itself. Uh, using the registry meant like we had to have uh, an extra step that is fetching the five gig image uh, on demand when the container is being launched. And this would definitely affect our container launch time. Uh, so we had to make sure that we had the image already on the host before we started launching it, and the local puller was the option that best suited us. So we had a way to, we, we needed a way to prefetch the image. Since we had to prefetch the image, we needed to now think about distributing this image to upwards of 30,000 hosts, and this image was close to five gigs in size. So uh, we looked at the first option, which is our default, which is our, the binary store that actually uh, hosts the binaries that get created as part of the CI. Um, uh, it was not designed for pushing uh, gigs of data to tens of thousands of nodes. However, it would work for just pushing application binaries to thousands of containers, and it should just work fine. So next, we looked at CERN BMFS, which is a uh, distributed file system uh, project uh, from CERN Labs in Switzerland. Uh, this would have the scale, but it did not have the ability to prefetch. It was a heavily cached uh, Distribution, uh, distribution service, uh, 
uh, which meant like the file is actually fetched on demand when uh, you try to access it. Uh, this had the implication that the container execution uh, would have unpredictable performance uh, since fetching the file on demand is, was totally reliant on the network's performance at that point. Uh, the third option and the obvious one is to use the appropriate uh, registry. For example, uh, we picked Docker image, so uh, Docker registry could have been used. Uh, but it did not allow us to prefetch, so we had this same problem that uh, we, could, we had to elongate the container launch time. So we ended up uh, rolling our own distribution mechanism based on the BitTorrent protocol, um, and uh, we made slight changes to the protocol to make sure that uh, it was more efficient to avoid uh, unnecessary off-rack traffic. Uh, so the protocol essentially prefers to fetch uh, pieces of files that are present locally uh, in the same rack. Um, it's worth calling out now that if we had had an object or a block store, uh, it would have totally worked, and we would have used it. Um, uh, since, our, since Twitter uses a private uh, cloud, we don't have those options. So we built a BitTorrent-based distribution system and uh, the system's installation looks roughly like this, um, where the binary store hosted the actual built uh, file system image. And uh, we had a layer of peers called as the seeders, uh, which were responsible for uh, downloading this binary, uh, downloading the image, and uh, making it available for the Mesos agents to download, uh, sorry, Mesos hosts to download. Uh, this was necessary since uh, the binary store did not have enough throughput to uh, match the uh, requirements of all of the high number of uh, Mesos agents that we have, Mesos hosts that we have. Uh, so the last layer is the leecher, which are peers that essentially talk to the seeders. And as you can see, um, the modified uh, BitTorrent protocol prefers fetching from a seeder that is in the local rack and uh, if there is no such uh, seeder in the same rack, it then, uh, it then goes over the rack. Uh, so we built it, and then we tried enabling and started distributing our first image, and we had a bad situation. Uh, so what happened was the torrent traffic ended up overwhelming the host NICs, and uh, it blocked all the traffic that were uh, going off of the host. Uh, which also blocked the heartbeats from the agent to the master, which led to uh, lost slaves and lost tasks. So uh, we had to restrict the resource usage of uh, BitTorrent peers. So some of the challenges that we faced here when we actually tried to isolate it. Um, firstly, uh, isolating the seeders were really easy because these were essentially Aurora jobs that were running inside containers and the container isolation automatically took care of restricting, restricting the resource usage. Uh, however, on the other hand, the leachers were not running inside a container, and we had to do this because the uh, leachers had to have access, uh, or like root privileges, to access the Mesos agent's uh, image cache. Uh, so the leacher ended up being a daemon running alongside the Mesos agent on every Mesos host. Um, so we had to manually isolate uh, resource usage for uh, the leachers. Uh, isolating CPU, memory, and disk was easy. It was just setting up appropriate C groups. Uh, however, it was not the same case when it came to isolating the network. Uh, this is because at Twitter we use a non-standard uh, network isolator called as the port mapping isolator that is present in Mesos, uh, which is complicated and makes it harder for changing it. So um, let me talk a little bit to explain how the port mapping isolator actually works. Um, a port mapping isolator tries to divide the range of ports that are available on a host and assign them to uh, containers. Um, each container then uh, gets its own network namespace, and uh, it also has a virtual Ethernet pair, uh, where one end of the pair is pushed into the network namespace, and the other end stays in the host. Uh, once we have done this, uh, 
appropriate routing from the host ethernet to the virtual ethernet uh, for the container that's present in the host is created so that any traffic that is destined for a particular port range is routed to that container uh, and vice versa. Um, and it's worth noting that we have, we also have a, a rate limit uh, or a hierarchical token bucket uh, rate limit that's installed on the containers uh, virtual ethernet uh, to limit any egress traffic. Uh, this way, uh, it makes sure that containers have isolated uh, network access and uh, we do not have starvation. Um, now we had to add uh, network isolation for a leecher, which meant we had to do the same or similar kind of setup for the leecher uh, by hand, um, which meant we had to create its own network namespace, uh, have a virtual ethernet pair, and it's all uh, uh, its own SGB rate limit. Uh, the point worth noting here is that uh, we have an extra uh, TC filter that we install on the virtual ethernet uh, for the leachers container uh, that's present in the host, um, which is the TC police filter. And we do this to limit ingress traffic as well. Uh, the reason we had to do this is because we could have a misbehaving uh, a torrent peer, which could uh, start flooding, uh, which could start sending uh, traffic to the leacher, uh, which could end up uh, flooding the ethernet and uh, Ethernet on the host and browning out the host altogether, which would affect the uh, rest of the containers. And we don't do this on our uh, production containers since those are uh, <coughs> tier one and tier zero services um, because um, TC police is very aggressive and tries to drop packages and forces uh, TCP to reduce its window size. Um, doing this for service uh, level, tier two service, uh, which is only used for distributing the images, seemed appropriate uh, since, we since we wanted to <coughs> minimize any effect to running production containers. Um, so we had a working distribution mechanism, and uh, before we could take it to production, we wanted to have a good story around uh, versioning these images that we were using. So we had a couple of, we looked at it and uh, we uh, came up with a couple of requirements. Uh, first off, we had to have full adoption, which meant like we had to use the big and fat image that we created uh, before. Um, and we also had to make sure that we had uh, multiple versions, we, we, we could maintain multiple versions of this image in case uh, we ever run into a vulnerability. Um, so we needed to have multiple uh, versions since it usually takes service owners longer to update their services and we had to make sure that we don't break running services. So the challenges uh, in this part were quite bad in that uh, we had certain uh, hardware profiles or hardware specification uh, that were not really designed for this use case and, and this turned out to be a significant portion of our fleet, uh, which was uh, practically old hardware that we were still continuing to run. Um, what it meant is like uh, these hosts had barely 100 gig disks, and even after carving out like 10% of these disks uh, away from container usage, we could only support a bare minimum of two versions. So we tried a bunch of things to try to reduce the image size, and uh, so, uh, we had picked Docker image as our image format. Um, and generally, most of the uh, container image formats out there uh, are support layering, and these layers are content addressable as well. So it was possible to dedupe layers that were shared across different images. So we looked at it. Um, however, it turned out that uh, due to the way Docker image creation works, uh, Docker images layering works, uh, Docker image tended to explode in size uh, due to the presence of whiteout files. Uh, these are files that get created when uh, a, a new file gets installed onto the file system and immediately in the next layer it gets deleted. So essentially we could have multiple versions for the same file um, in the container image but when we actually unpack the image and recreate the file system, it may not even uh, 
uh, be present in the eventual file system that gets created. And we also found that uh, the Docker file format and the command sequence that we had to uh, use um, to make sure that we got the maximum amount of deduplication turned out to be quite tricky. So uh, we had to tweak the Docker file quite a bit to get the correct deduplication that we wanted. So this led to a really unpredictable build process, uh, which was um, not favorable. So essential takeaway is that full file system isolation at scale is really hard just because of the scale part. Um, so going back to the question, how did we actually pull off the upgrade? Turns out um, our peculiar infrastructure actually had certain advantages. Um, and it comes out as these two points where uh, the jars and pixels which were used for our artifact formats stood in for the isolation since these were self-contained uh, in terms of dependencies. And since we had very opinionated uh, infrastructure which limited the number of options that we actually provided to our customers, uh, we thereby limited the coupling that could be uh, happening between uh, services and the host, which meant like uh, even after, uh, even if a Python uh, library had native bindings to a particular uh, host OS, uh, if we just solve the, fix the problem for one service, we could, we essentially fix the problem for the rest of the fleet as well. Um, so on the whole, now comparing the different styles of, uh, different levels of file system isolation, um, we found that um, uh, uh, we, we compared it all along different dimensions, namely the container launch delay, uh, the time, it, uh, the extra time that would be needed to launch our containers, um, in which case, if you don't have any image at all, that would be the best case. Uh, and then we looked at service debugging where uh, we get the same uh, file system environment that could be used, uh, that would be used in production and could be replicated in the development environment. Uh, service agility and operational agility would be uh, really high if there is full isolation. However, uh, having just partial isolation just makes it work. Um, when we had vulnerability updates and we had rollout fixes, um, isolation uh, did, if having no isolation meant that we could uh, roll out a fix to all services at once, but uh, it had the other problems of not being able to properly canary changes. Um, when it came to the number of images that people could have, uh, if we were to allow service owners to create their own images, um, if we had uh, chosen full isolation, uh, we would end up with huge images and essentially limiting the number of images that the system can support at any point in time. So in this case, a partial isolated uh, application-specific uh, image would have been more appropriate. Um, and lastly, we have uh, uh, service, service owners to own their own dependencies, in which case uh, full isolation is the best uh, scenario. However, it comes with the drawback of being uh, bloated in terms of image size. So even here, uh, partial isolation seems to be the middle ground. So the key takeaway that I want to enforce is that um, application level file system isolation has the better of all the worlds and uh, uh, full isolation seems to be the hardest. Thank you. I was wondering how many container base images are you, are you deploying? Because it, it sounds like you put quite a lot of effort into prefetching. Um, do you change those images a lot or um, are you just planning for the future? Because if you have one image, the prefetch impact perhaps matters less because once you've got one, one task running on each machine, it's, it's there and it's going to stay there for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually, like I mentioned, uh, we provide both the JVM and Python runtimes. Uh, 
uh, directly out of the box, so we had to maintain it. And uh, we do have multiple versions of JVM that we provide at any point in time, because the JVM is also owned by a separate team, and they have Kennedy versions and other versions. So uh, similarly for the case for Python as well. So we have multiple layers of these same, so multiple versions of these libraries, which essentially bloats up the image. Any other questions? I'm just curious, how long does it take to, to prefetch um, an image? Uh, so we were able to push uh, a five gig image in less than two hours. Less to, than two hours yeah. into the entire cluster? To the entire cluster. OK, thanks. Uh, one thing I noticed uh, that I didn't see um, mentioned, maybe I missed it, uh, that I'm wondering about is um, with this partial isolation uh, approach that you were favoring, I think, um, if I read it correctly, um, do you have some other uh, means in your peculiar infrastructure for managing like um, subversion of one microservice on a, on a box? letting you leapfrog to others with a partial isolation thing more easily? Or um, is that not as a concern for other reasons for you? Um, I didn't understand the second part. The, uh, <laughs> file system isolation, um, one of the reasons that like, uh, my team's been investigating file system isolation is as part of a cohesive security boundary um, between multi-tenant uh, applications owned by different service owners that might have different security stances because of their target audience or maturity or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, how do you guys handle that conflict? Yeah, we with the not, partial isolation thing. Is uh, okay. with, with the partial, so with the partial isolation, you are expected to. Uh, it, it's very similar to application containers, where anything that's specific to the application gets bundled into the uh, container image, and anything that's provided by the platform is uh, then mounted or like shared overlaid on top of this. So it's up completely up to the service owners to package whichever way they want, and they would have to deal with it. It's not dependent on the platform itself. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Antosh.